do a quick follow-up on something that I put in my Foundry Explained video that people still are kind of having a hard time understanding. Uh, why Palantir, why a Palantir cloud is a must. And when I say cloud in this sense, I'm not talking about like going out and building all the infrastructure. I'm talking about an abstraction layer that sits above Azure GCP and AWS. And in a clip I'm about to play from you for you, uh, the CEO of Databricks is going to agree with me. Okay. And, um, the reason is, is that developers have this like horrible experience right now, spending all kinds of time trying to build, trying to write code specifically related to all how you deploy your app within the cloud infrastructure. And that is just a terrible experience. It takes a ton of time. The code is always sort of a liability. It's never an asset uh, that's related to this control plane. And so if Palantir can step in and um, provide the big data OS through its own website, you go to Palantir and sign up, and then you can integrate all of these various services like Databricks as a pluggable module into Foundry, they will be the biggest fucking company ever. And, you know, if I'm a business, you know, I probably have some legacy system, some blend of services from a hyperscalers that include some of, um, you know, the products that do something similar to what you just talked about. And now I'm also weighing options from, you know, a plethora of new vendors like yourself and others. So how are enterprises thinking about this? What should their strategy be? And, and how do you think it needs to be different than how it was in the past? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, number one, uh, they're now seeing that, you know, OK, I could go with the cloud scalers. Uh, but which one should I pick? Which cloud is the best one for me? And that seems to be changing. You know, the only game in town was AWS initially. You know, then Azure came along and it's doing really, really great. And then now we have Google and then there's Alibaba. So which one should I pick? And what if I pick the wrong one? Right. So more and more they're thinking, wow, and we're paying quite a bit. Uh, it would be good to have some optionality and not just lock ourselves into one. So multi-cloud is becoming a thing. And I think that's why you're seeing this, you know, what I call, you know, the sky computing vendors like us and Snowflake and Okta and, you know, Mongo uh, come along, the layer on top that gives them the optionality and they don't have to get locked in. So that's one really important thing. The second thing is um, they, they don't want to get locked in. They don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. So they want to choose something that's open. Why? Because, you know, in the past, there were great companies like Oracle and others that sold them amazing tech, but it wasn't open. So they got locked in. And over years, that company did not need to innovate anymore. And now they couldn't get off of it because they're locked in. So openness is another thing that a lot of enterprises care about. And if you look again at the FANGs, Facebook, Amazon, Google, they all base their stuff on open source technology. So that's a second really important consideration. So they want something that's open so that they, again, have flexibility. And then third, they want the AI and the machine learning. That's important for them because that's how the big guys did it they want to be able to do the same thing. So I think those three uh, are really, really critical and top of mind for most CIOs and sort of enterprise architects and people that are making the decision around what would the data future for them look like. Mm. Yeah, and when I talk to a lot of companies about this and their efforts to become data-driven, uh, you know, a lot of them won't cite the technology as a hurdle, uh, but rather you know, getting a, the talent pool needed to actually support that. How, as a CEO, do you have to think about that in developing your own platform to maybe help address some of those challenges um, or make it easier for companies to maybe not pursue the same you know, quantity or level of talent as they might have needed in the past to be able to support some of these like AI ML algorithms? Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, that's you know when we started the business, we would ask people, what technology should I build for you? And they would say, can you help me hire people? So, well, we're not recruiters, you know, and so that's what I really need. I need you to help me hire people. Uh, so very early on, we realized that this is going to be a big bottleneck for enterprises, right? They don't have the 30,000 engineers that Google had with PhDs and whatnot. So how do we help them? And what we came up with is, one, open source is really important because these open source technologies, they create these big communities. These communities, they can help you. You can go online. You can ask questions. You know, they can solve the problem for you. There are books. There are courses. Uh, which would not have been possible if we were just one company doing private proprietary code. So that's one way you can help them sort of democratize and get access to information and, you know, recruit people from those communities. So that's really, really important. Um, the second thing that's important is that your platform can actually support the different people in an organization. Turns out there are different personas that all need to use data. So early on, we called it uh, unified analytics. We wanted to enable different people in the organization to be able to use Databricks. So we built different facets. There's one facet that targets data scientists. They might know statistics, but not everybody knows that. 
So we also have a facet which is for analysts. They might not know any machine learning or statistics. They're just analysts. They want to look at some you know, graphs and dashboards. And then we built a facet for data engineers. Um, and the data engineers, they're much more you know, advanced software engineers. So the product literally has different ways you can enter it and access it so that it can be more uh, usable within these enterprises. So that not everybody has to be that sort of you know, Stanford PhD to use it. All right, guys, here's another one of these um, sort of high level, I believe what what uh, the CEO of Databricks was calling like the sky cloud layer. This is the serverless cloud and they're offering a similar abstraction layer that abstracts away code you want to run to build APIs from the underlying um, cloud vendor and their control plane, which is just terrible in 90% of the cases. So this is another one of these things that's happening within the developer community as a way to like, let's abstract away AWS. Let's not write any more code that's specific to AWS and the same thing for GCP and the same thing for Azure. So he's really hit on something that is a big wave right now. All right, guys, I wanted to also show you what a really innovative company, Versal, with the people who built a developer framework called Next.js, which lets you rapidly build applications in front-end frameworks. Uh, they have an integration layer for their cloud. And now this is not their infrastructure. They run this on top of an other cloud infrastructure. But they allow you to come in here and just select the services like Shopify that are going to be part of your app, right? Fauna is a document database. It's just a database as a service. It's a lot like DynamoDB from Amazon, but better. Shocker, right? <laughs> but um, what's really cool about this is anyone can come in here and build these integrations. You can see Datadog in here. What about Palantir doing the same thing and providing the same integration suite into the big data OS, right? So this is something that the industry is already moving towards on numerous levels. If you haven't checked out Versal and your developer, dude, you got to check out Versal because <laughs> it is amazing. Um, you know, they they basically allow you to go from code to deployment like right away. But this is another example of that higher level abstraction over the cloud vendors that is coming. That's going to be the next big thing in application development. And this is going to force the cloud vendors back into what they should have been in the first place, which are infrastructure companies. Stop building competitive products from in, from people that just specialize in that one thing. And there, I think ultimately what you'll end up seeing is a lot of these services they've built will be open sourced and, they, and support will be removed as companies like Palantir and companies like Databricks, MongoDB provide a superior service built on top of that infrastructure with none of the shit that developers hate to do. Okay, so that, I think that's really what's coming. When I talk about Palantir building a cloud, I'm talking about this abstraction layer that's already we're already seeing in numerous other places uh, coming to fruition. And I think they're crazy not to do it. If they don't do it, they're crazy. All right. Um, the other thing that's, you know, Palantir is going to have to do is they're going to have to build this developer community. You know, if you listen to the latter part of that clip that I played you, I played for you guys, it's totally clear, like in, in everyone's mind that works in this industry, like without a commitment to open source, without building a thriving developer community, you're just going to die. And, um, and businesses want open source tech for flexibility and to bring down the risk profile because you're taking advantage of an existing talent pool that's already trained in your software. And those people will become developer advocates for your tech, which is awesome. Um, and you also, what people don't realize about um, building these developer communi communities is they're essentially a B2C play. So like, can you imagine like if you have, you know, a, a successful open source tool that's downloaded by millions of developers, how hard is it to build an app? that gets a million plus users. It's hard, it's fucking hard. These um, open source initiatives, the developer community is its own market. It is its own consumer space. And this could be Palantir's first big play in that B2C space. And if they play their cards right, that this will translate into huge network effects and market opportunities for them. So um, I think that, you know, Palantir must, must build this developer community and it needs to invest in its own cloud to abstract away all the complexity of the underlying cloud providers providers and they're the best position to do this with apollo so in my opinion if there is a company that could pull this off it's palantir